So as they take in their seats, you can see on the board, it's what I want to speak to us about um, this morning. And I waited on God for this word, so I know, I know 100% that this is the word for this morning. Because I asked God for the word, and God gave me this word, and God put it together. And, uh, and sometimes you'll go down a line of thought, and then God will change that line of thought and give you a different sermon. Because you think you're going to preach this, and then during the week God changes it, and you end up preaching something completely different. But this whole week, I know that God wanted me to preach this. So I want to speak to us about victory in Jesus. Do you and I have victory in Jesus? I just want to ask you that for a minute. Do you have victory in Jesus? Who has victory in Jesus this morning? Amen. We all have victory in Jesus. Amen. So I'd like to read to us first out of the Old Testament. It says something. It says, For the Lord your God is He who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. And for all the people who say, Oh, but that's Old Testament. The New Testament in 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the world's eyes, when Jesus was crucified, it was the end. It looked like a failure. It looked like a defeat. And it looked like the enemy had won. Because this man that was going around preaching the kingdom of God and telling people to repent and healing the sick and casting out devils, they got rid of him. He was arrested, he was beaten, beaten, he was tortured. They put that crown of thorns on his head. Amen. Have you ever thought about that crown of thorns? It was, it was more than that one that's on the wall there. We have a crown of thorns there. It was much more than that. It was long thorns. And it was shoved on his head by people that hated him. It wasn't a friend that put that crown of thorns on. It was somebody that hated him. And they spat on him and they pulled his beard out. Men with a beard, if somebody pulls one of their hairs out and you're not expecting it, it hurts. They grabbed whole pieces of his beard and they pulled it out with their hands. And they pulled out his beard. And by all natural terms, if you are looking what happened with Jesus, and then you're looking at Jesus and he's crucified and he's hanging there, and he's nailed to the cross, he couldn't take himself down if he wanted to, he's nailed there. Until he dies, he's placed there. Amen? If you look at that in natural terms, that's defeat, right? The man's defeated. He's captured. His enemies have gotten hold of him. They've beaten him after death and now they've crucified him and left him there to die. It's finished. But actually, the cross is the victory that we have as Christians. Because on the cross, victory was achieved for us. You know what the scripture says in Colossians? It says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements. I'm going to explain this. Having wiped out the handwriting of accusations. That were against us, which were opposite to us, which were our enemy. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to his cross, the King James says. I'd rather say the King James. Having nailed it to his cross. You know where the power of the enemy against us comes from? It comes from the fact that we have broken God's law. Everything in this universe, everything in the world is held together by God's law. God holds everything, time, space, eternity, earth, all the galaxies, every person in the palm of his hand. He controls it. When he threw out the stars and knew them by name, he controlled it. Do you know that the Bible says that he threw out space and that space is still expanding? The Bible says it. And it was written thousands of years ago. And I think it was about 20 years ago the scientists discovered, Oh, do you know that space is still expanding? <laughs> and it was written in the Bible. And we've known it for thousands of years that God says space is still expanding. God's in control of all of it. Amen? And the enemy takes God's laws that the sin, the soul that sins shall die. That God cannot smile at sin. If you've broken God's law and you have sinned against Him, then it's sin, disease, sickness, and death. That's the order. Amen? For the wages of sin is death. If you sin, you cannot have life because life comes from God. If you sin, you've separated yourself from a holy God because He can't agree with sin and smile at it and accept it close to Him because sin brings separation between man and God, right? So the enemy has a list of accusations against you. And he can prove that you are guilty before God by what you've done. And that's how horrible the devil is, eh? Because he comes and whispers to you, he says, do this, do this, do this. And when you give in to the temptation and you do it, he then accuses you before God about what you've done. 
He convinces you to do it, but he says, no, I told him to do it. He didn't have to do it. But look what he did, Lord. You know what the Bible says? The devil is the accuser of the brethren. He accuses us before God day and night. And that's beautiful why Jesus ascended into heaven. He went to sit on the right hand of the Father where he intercedes for us day and night. Amen. But that list of accusations that gives the devil power over you when Jesus died, taking your place as the substitute, that whole list of things that I did, he took and nailed them to his cross. Amen. And if you want to put it this way, when he was tied to Pilate's whipping post and they hit him with a cat of nine tails, every time that whip hit his back, my sins were written in his back. Lying, swearing, stealing, cheating. When they put the nail in Jesus' hand, he put it in there, blaspheming against God. Use the name of Jesus in vain. My sins were written upon Jesus' body and crucified to the cross. Amen. We have victory in that cross. Do you know that there were battles and victories that were won on this earth that changed the course of the earth? Think about what would have happened and where we would be living now and how we would be living now if Hitler won World War II. If the Germans won World War II, we wouldn't be sitting in the type of place we're sitting in now. Everything would be different. But because the Allies won, it shaped the world. Certain victories have shaped the world and changed it. But when Jesus died on the cross and victoriously said, It is finished. I have paid the price. It's done. Tetelestai, paid in full. Which they translated to, it is finished. But if you take it back to the Greek, it actually means paid in full. The debt of all mankind and all that will be born, paid in full. If anyone will come to my cross and come to my blood, I will take away their sin because I paid it in full. Paid in full. Amen. And that day on that cross, on that lonely hill, the greatest victory was achieved that was ever achieved. And that victory changed not just the physical world. It changed the earth and it changed all eternity and it changed all spiritual things. I believe when Jesus said it's finished and he breathed out his loss, as he breathed his breath out, I believe there was a spiritual shockwave that hit all of eternity. A spiritual shockwave went out and hit hell and heaven and everything. It went, done. It broke the power of the enemy and loosed us from his control. Amen? That's why every man, woman, boy, girl and child is given an option. Come to Christ or don't. If you don't come to Christ, you're under the control and the dominion of the prince of this world. And you are bound. And you're his captor. Although the victory has already been achieved, I'm still bound. That's why the Bible says the prince of this world has blinded their eyes so that the glorious light of the gospel does not come to them so that they might be saved and freed. Amen? The devil will do everything to hide the truth of the gospel. The victory of the cross, he's trying to hide it. Because if you're blind and bound and you'll come to Christ and say, there's a victory for me here, he looses you, he sets you free, he opens you up your eyes. Amen? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Amen? It's beautiful, isn't it? There was a victory that was achieved for us on that cross. Listen to what 2 Corinthians says. Thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in a triumphant procession. Quickly, I want to stop. There was a few years ago when Pastor Donnie came past me. I was walking and I was going through some stuff. I was having a bit of a battle. And he came past me, looked at me and he said, Are you in Urvinning? I said, in Urvinning. How are you? Are you walking in victory? He just said that to me. Looked at me and said, Are you walking in victory? And as he said it to me, the whole situation, it was like the Holy Spirit went, Boom. And I was like, Oh, I'm in a fight. And I'm losing the fight because I don't realize somebody's already won the victory for me. And I'm trying to fight the fight out of my own strength. And as long as I try to do it myself, in myself, by myself, I'm never going to get it right. But if I come to Christ who's already given me the victory, then I realize, wait, there's a strait that I must strait, there's a winning to verkry. There's a fight that I must fight, but there's a victory to be achieved as well. Amen? There's a victory for us. Thanks be to God, who by Christ Jesus, leads us in a triumphant procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. That scripture has a spiritual connotation to it. You know that? I walked past a gentleman yesterday, yeah. And when I walked past him, I said hello to him because I was waiting for people to come before we went. As I walked past him on the street, 
I sh- I'm sure he smelled my aftershave, and when he came past, I smelled his aftershave. I smelled it, and I smiled at him, he smiled at me, he smelled it, and it was like an unspoken thing. There was a savor. When he came past, he smelled good. When I came past, I smelled good. Amen? I was on my way to church. I don't know where he was on his way to. But we as children of God, when you've come to Christ, and I've been washed with that blood, there's a savor that I carry in the Spirit. There's an, not just the anointing, but there is a, a spiritual smell and a spiritual savor, which is also like a taste, like the taste of salt. When I've come to Jesus, I carry that always with me. When I walk into a place, I can disturb people that are devil-possessed because I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, and I carry that savor with me. Amen? And then there's people that are busy with other things, and they carry a savor of other things as well. And as you as a child of God with what we call onuscading, discernment, you can perceive, and sometimes your spirit will bots off of somebody. You'll, you'll bounce off somebody because they're busy with other things. And they're carrying a savor of death unto death, the scripture says. And we are carrying a savor of life unto life. Because when I come to Jesus, I'm translated out of death into life. So I'm carrying a savor of life wherever I go. But God leads us in Jesus by a triumphant procession. As victors. As a triumphant procession, I want to link it to two scriptures and I want to explain something to you. Ephesians 4, 8 says, Therefore, he says, when Jesus ascended on high, when he had said to his disciples, I'm going back to prepare a place for you and I'll come back to take you where I am. And they saw him go up into heaven. And they stood staring and the angel appeared and said, what are you doing? That same Jesus you're trying to look at, he's coming back again in the same way that he left. So it says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men and explain it now and the last one colossians 2 15 says having disarmed listen disarmed the powers and the authorities he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross in the cross jesus christ broke satan's back in the cross jesus pulled every one of his teeth out In the cross, Jesus disarmed him. How did he disarm him? Because the power he had against you was by the sin that you had done, and he disarmed him by his blood taking away the sin. So the power of the enemy against you is made to naught, because he can't touch you. If you have not sinned, and you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and you washed by the blood, what claim does the enemy have to me? What claim does he have against me in front of God? He doesn't. Jesus disarmed him. He has no power over you. He has no authority over you. You're not a child of His kingdom. You're a child of the kingdom of light. The God that made heaven and earth all things visible and invisible and made Lucifer before he had pride in himself and said, I will lift myself up. And God says, I'll spit you out of the heavens as profane. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That same God who created him, you under His authority and His power in His kingdom as His child. Amen? And by what Jesus did on the cross, he's disarmed him. Amen. And when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. In the old kingdom, in the old days, in Bible times, when a king went to war against another king, and they had a battle, and the king won, you know what he would do? He would take everybody that's left from the other kingdom, including the king, and strip him naked. Most times they'd put a hook through the top of the mouth, yeah? Afrikaans is full. Yamalta, what's the English? Pallet, thank you. Through the pallet and out the nose. A hook through the pallet, out the nose with a chain and connect it to the next person and the next person and the next person and the next person. And lead those people behind his army. The king's sitting on a horse, his army's there. And now here comes the other king and their army. Naked, with a hook through their mouth. They cannot do anything. They've got no power. And he leads them through his own city in a triumphant procession saying these tried to kill us look what we've done with them we've stripped them of all power we've stripped them of everything they can't save themselves they're at our mercy that's what the bible is saying to you and i about the victory that was achieved for us by the lord jesus christ one on his cross he broke the power of the enemy two when he ascended into the heavens because it's 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 what are they called Demons, devils, principalities, and powers of spiritual wickedness in high places. They occupy sometimes the atmosphere and the air. And when Jesus ascended on high, he went straight through. 
straight through that area, straight through all their power, and ascended on high. And when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. He took captive all the things that have been binding mankind for eternity. All the things that, that we had no power to fight against. He disarmed them, uncleared, took away their clothes, and bound them, and led them captive. Now look at that scripture again quickly, how powerful it is. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in a triumphant procession. I'm always walking behind the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords on His horse. I'm always walking with my armor in my hand. I'm always in a triumphant procession. Through us He spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. Therefore He says when He, led, when he ascended on high, He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Amen. And the last one, having disarmed the powers and authorities, He made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them by the cross. When Jesus was crucified, it wasn't done in a corner, eh? It was done on the hill called Mount Calvary, or otherwise Golgotha. Do you know that that hill, you can see the entrance to the temple. You can see the entrance to the Holy of Holies. It's a direct line. It was done on a hill for all to see. And for almost three hours, it went dark across the whole entire world. They have documents, historical documents, of people on the other side of the world in China and places like that saying that it has gone dark for three hours in the middle of the day. We can't explain it, but all I can feel is this. Somebody that God really loves is hurting right now. That's a person who knew nothing about what was going on on the other side of the world. Amen? It wasn't hidden away. The enemy knows if you come to the cross, he's got no more power over you. Amen? The cross cancels out anything that the devil can do to you and me. Amen? How can I achieve this continual, I'm going to add the word continual victory in Jesus. Because there's times, let's be honest, it's easy to preach now and it's easy to stand in the church and when somebody asks you, how's it going? You say, oh, it's going well, praise the Lord, this, that. But when nobody else is around you and you hit the difficult times, how is it possible for you when you're in your storm and you're in your valley, how is it possible for you to have the victory that Christ achieved for you? Amen. How is it possible for you to stand in victory in Jesus when maybe you don't know how you're going to pay your rent or how you're going to buy groceries or how you're going to do this or how you're going to do the next thing? How is it possible for you to stand in the victory in Jesus when maybe you've got a pain in your body and it's been there for a while and it's not going away and you can't sleep and you don't feel lacquer? How? How do you achieve that victory? It's very important for you and I as children of God to be armed with the Word of God. You need to be armed with the Word of God. Because the Word of God is living and active. When you look at your Bible, I want you to understand something. That Word, the Logos, the written Word of God, don't underestimate it. Don't want to scut that Bible of yours and don't look at that Bible of yours as just a book. Because it's not just a book. Because when you get into it and it gets into you, you realize it's alive. And it has power. And it is sharper than any two-edged sword. I love that it's a two-edged sword because it cuts this way and it cuts that way. So when I get busy with God and I mean to serve God in spirit and in truth, a lot of times that word will inspect me and cut out of me things that shouldn't be there and show me myself as I am. But also when I'm in the difficulties and I'm facing a battle and I'm facing an enemy and I'm facing a omstandigheden and I'm facing a temptation and I'm facing difficulty in life, you better pick up that sword because it's very sharp on the other side that you can use it for your defense. Amen? But if you do not know what God's word says to you about the Lord Jesus Christ and about who you are in Jesus, how are you ever going to stand? It is very important for you and I as children of God to get into God's word and to get God's word into you. There's something amazing about God's word. It will change you like nothing else on this earth. If you pray and if you read God's word consistently, those two things will change you like nothing on earth can change you. Amen? I was changed dramatically and drastically and completely and forever when I began to do those two things seriously. When I began to read God's word and pray. And the strange thing about that word is this, is that if I look at it and it stands on my bedside and I do not take it and put it into me, it will not do anything for me. Inside of it is, 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 is more power than a million atom bombs. Inside of it is more treasure than in Fort Knox. Inside of it is more health than a thousand hospitals. Inside of it is more provision 
than any great rich uncle you have. Inside of it is all that you need, but it will remain in there unless you pick it up and get it into you. If you don't get it into you, it cannot change you. But if you pick up it and you get into that word and that word gets into you, it will change you forever. Amen? You know why we are not victorious? Two main reasons. The first one is this. We fail when the battle comes because we fail to prepare. What did Jesus say to his disciples? Wake up and pray. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then he says something. Pray so that you do not enter into temptation. Who here hates temptation? I hate temptation. I'm waiting for the moment I get into heaven. Because in heaven, no more temptation, no more sin, no more pain, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more heartache. But that's my home. I'm not there yet. Do you know where I am right now? I'm currently behind enemy lines. I'm currently behind enemy lines. Though I'm in God's territory, I'm still behind enemy lines. Everywhere I put my foot is God's territory because He's in me, but I'm still behind enemy lines. And while I'm behind enemy lines, what soldier is it that can put down the shield and the sword and take off the helmet while behind enemy lines? You know how many people died in World War II when their chief and their commanding officer said to them, you don't take off your helmet. You know how many of them took off their helmet when something happened and they got shot in the head? You and I cannot back off until the moment that we cross over into heaven. Amen? So we fail because we fail to prepare. When the temptation hits, we lose in the temptation because we weren't praying before. Do you know that the battle that you face on the Friday is won most times on the Monday and the Tuesday? And what I did on Monday and Tuesday, not knowing what was about to hit me on Friday really determines how Friday turns out. If Monday and Tuesday, I will just do what I always do, like Daniel did three times a day, opened his windows towards Jerusalem and prayed. If I will do that on Monday, Tuesday, not knowing what's coming, but I go down and say, Lord, I need you. Nothing's happening in my life right now. I'm on calm seas, but Lord, I need you. You know why I can say that? I can say that because I've been through times where it wasn't calm seas. And I've been through times where it wasn't calm seas, where I wasn't praying two days before. And then I'm scrambling to find God. And I'm looking at the storms and the winds and I'm sinking. And I'm saying, Jesus, where are you? Don't you care? I'm drowning. Jesus says, yeah, you've got to look for me now because you weren't looking for me three, four days ago. That's why now on a Monday, I go down and I say, Lord, I love you because you first loved me. Lord, I thank you for my beautiful wife, Lord. Bless you. I thank you for my children. Thank you for the congregation. I pray for the congregation. I pray for myself. Lord, I need you. Valleys are wider. Amen. Valleys are darker, they're deeper. I need you more today than I did yesterday. And then Tuesday I do the same thing. Lord, I need you every day, every hour, every moment. Every second, every step of the way. I do not rely upon myself, I rely upon you. You know what happens if I hit the trouble on Friday? I don't have to go looking for God. I keep doing what I was doing Monday and Tuesday. Amen? That's the first reason we fail. You know why the second reason we fail is? Because when we hit situations, we do not know what God's word says about that specific situation. And we fail. And we fail. I want to encourage you. Pray, but I want to encourage you this as well. Start to get into God's word for yourself. It's not good enough that you hear me preach and open a word to you on a Sunday morning. And a Sunday evening maybe. That's not good enough for you for your life. Just to receive on a Sunday. I want to ask you something quickly. Do you only eat food on a Sunday morning? You don't. So how can you only read God's word on a Sunday morning? Come, natural terms. If I only eat on a Sunday morning, how strong am I going to be to do work on a Friday and a Saturday? I'm going to be physically weak because I'm not nurturing and nourishing myself physically. So spiritually, we want to wonder, but I love God. Why do I always get bowled over when the situations and the difficulties come? Why is it always me that's lying and asking people to pray for them? It's because you're only eating once a week. No wonder you can't stand when the enemy comes against you. Amen? I want to guarantee you this because I've tested it and tried it. Ask my wife. We've tested it and tried it. Ask anybody else that's walked with God for a while. Every situation you're facing, there's an answer for it in God's word if you will go and ask God for it. Every situation. Are you struggling for finances? God's word says, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. How? Through Christ Jesus, my Lord. Amen? Amen? Are you struggling for finances? God says, He knows the things that you have need of. But He says to you, knock, ask, and seek. 
Amen? You've been running around trying to make plans for yourself, for your finances, but you haven't done what God's Word says. God's Word says ask. God's Word says knock. God's Word says seek. God's Word says ask of me and I'll give it unto you. Amen? God knows what we have need of. Are you sick in your body? What does God's Word say to you about are you sick in your body? I want to ask you quickly, are you believing what people have said? No, no, no. God puts sickness on people so that God can test them and try them. So that God can make them more spiritually strong. Do you know that that is not written anywhere in God's Word? It does not exist nowhere in God's Word. If you find me that scripture and bring it to me, I'll eat my shoe in front of the congregation. I'm not lying to you. I'm not lying. If you bring me a scripture that says something like that, I'll eat my shoe. I'll eat it in front of all of you. Because God's Word says over and over and over again from Genesis, Exodus actually, Exodus, I am the God that healeth thee. I will put none of the sicknesses of Egypt upon you. Amen. And if you bring it to the New Testament, what does he say? By his stripes we are healed. He himself bore my infirmities in his body upon the cross. He carried my sicknesses. And listen at Pilate's whipping post, by his stripes we are healed. Amen. You need to claim that. If I am not healed by Jesus' stripes, then explain to me why was Jesus whipped. If Jesus' stripes don't heal me, then he was whipped for no reason. Have you thought about that? By his stripes, I am healed. So when you get sick, you've got to decide, am I going to take what the devil's offering me? Because he comes with a menu. He comes with a menu. You get a pain in the side here, and he pops up in your mind quickly, and he says, what do you want? <laughs> Do you want it to be cancer? Do you want it to be an ulcer? Do you want it to be stomach? Do you want it to be a briac? What do you want? And he's offering you these thoughts that go through your head. At that moment, you must be able to know what the Word of God says. The Word of God says it there. The thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. So if you have a pain, he's going to come and ask you. I want to steal your health. I want to kill you. I want to destroy you. But what does Jesus say? I am come that they might have life and that they might have it. What? More abundantly. Jesus came to give me life that overflows. When I look at the word of God, Moses was how old? I can't remember. But God said to him, go to the top of the mountain. I'm going to take you home. You don't have to have sickness to die. But sometimes it does happen that you pass away from sickness. But God's plan for you is to have life and life more abundantly. Amen? Overflowing life. He purchased it for you. What does God's word say to you when you feel like you're being attacked by the devil? Listen, there's sometimes I'm going through trials and temptations. There's sometimes God's looking at my heart and saying, Okay, if this difficulty hits him, is he going to forsake me? Is he going to leave me? Or does he really believe what he said to me when he said, Lord, I love you, I'll follow you, no matter what happens in my life. And then sometimes God will allow a situation and circumstance to come to try your heart, to test you, to see. Amen? But there's other times the enemy will come against you. There's other times it will be the devil, it will be witchcraft, it will be somebody at your work that's possessed by a devil that gives you an issue. Sometimes it will be those things. Then what are you going to say? What does the word say to you about spiritual things like that? What does God's word say? What, what does it say? Do you know? The Bible says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And I condemn every tongue that rises up against me in judgment. Why? This is my heritage as a servant of God and my righteousness comes from Him. What does that scripture do? That scripture tells me the enemy can't touch me because I'm in Christ and I'm His and I'm righteous because of Him. So I give Him glory and if I'm in Him, the enemy can't touch me. The Bible also says, I give you. First person, God saying, I give to you power to tread over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. Amen? It won't harm you. God holds you in the palm of His hand but He casts out devils with a finger. Amen. He's got you here, but he casts out devils with a finger. So when the enemy comes to offer you something, say to him straight, I rebuke you, devil, in Jesus' name, leave, because God came to give me life and life more abundantly. I don't accept what's on your menu. My body's healthy. It's every whit hole in Jesus' name. Amen. But you fail because you do not know what God's word says to you. You need to know who you are in Christ Jesus. Amen. What does the Bible say to us? In Christ Jesus, I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen? Do you know what the scripture means? The belt of truth. Put on the belt of truth. What is that? What's the belt of truth? Do you know what the scripture says about the truth? Amen? You can quote that scripture, but it'll mean nothing if you don't know what the belt of truth is. 
What is the belt of truth? Thy word is truth. Thy word is light. Amen? You know what the belt was for? The belt was to hold the weapons and hold everything together. Amen? It's the truth of God's word. The breastplate of righteousness. How do you know that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus if you have not found it out from God's word? It's good for me to tell you these things. It's good for me to teach you these things. But it is 100% better for you to go into God's word and search it out. And when God shows it to you, that you understand it for yourself. God will reveal it to you here while I'm preaching. But there's so much more that God can reveal to you when you will read God's word. I only have, I only have you for a limited amount of time. So I, every service can only bring across one thought or one idea to you. One thing that God is saying. But if you will go to God's word every... On Monday, God can give you three things. On Tuesday, God can give you another one that's powerful. On Wednesday, God can give you maybe four things. Amen? On a Sunday morning, I can give you one. And I can expound on that one. But if you will search the scriptures and begin to know God for yourself and who you are in Him, you'll understand, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, not by my own works. Which means, if I have failed God today, it doesn't mean the enemy is allowed to attack me today just because I failed Him today, because I was never righteous in myself. I stand in the righteousness that Christ purchased for me by His blood. So when I make a mistake... I'm not talking about living in abiding and staying in sin. I'm talking about when you make a mistake. Because a lot of Christians think they make a mistake and the door goes open for the devil to punish them. It's not like that. Because he knows my frame. If I make a mistake and I confess, the breastplate of righteousness never leaves me. It's given to me of God. Amen? And the gifts and the calling of God without repentance. I have the shoes of peace. What's the peace I'm talking about? I'm talking about the gospel. That I was separated from God and didn't know Him and I had no peace. But then all of a sudden when I get, got to know Jesus, I got to know the Prince of Peace. And His peace is in me and covers me. I have a peace now that I can't explain to you. It's not a hippie, airy, fairy peace where you see me doing this and I'm, 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 always, I'm always happy. But there's a peace in me that I can't explain. It's a peace that goes so far past understanding. It's a peace that I, I can't explain it to you, but it's so precious to me that even when the dog has bumped the bry over and the meat is lying on the floor and I'm trying to hit it with the broom, there's still peace there. That I can put the feet, meat back on, I can repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry I hit the dog with the broom, and I can get back to brying and there's a peace that's still there. I messed up, but just because I messed up because the dog bumped the bry doesn't mean that God stripped me of the peace. As long as I can quickly, Lord, I messed up, I shouldn't have hit the dog, I ask you to forgive me, and I carry on with life. That peace remains in me. Amen? And it's a peace the world didn't give me, and the world can't take it away. I want to explain something to you what's happening in society now. They do not have peace, and they run to antidepressants right now. Do you know how big the antidepressant market has gotten in the last 20 years? It is exploding how many people run to antidepressants. Because they cannot process life, they cannot process situations that have happened, and they cannot see a future, and on the inside of them, they just can't process. They can't process. And they're trying to do it themselves. And they're looking for a worldly solution. But there's one who said, I will give you... Why are they the shoes of peace? Because wherever I walk, I'm in peace. Whether I'm in the valley, I'm in peace. Whether I'm on the mountaintop, I'm in peace. Whether I'm in troubles, I'm in peace. Whether I'm not in troubles, I'm in peace. Wherever I go, I carry that message of peace with me. Amen? The shield of faith. Do you guys know what that is? In other words, when I pick up that shield of faith, because it says above all things, pick up the shield of faith. What is my faith in when I pick up that shield? You can never have faith in your knowledge of the scriptures. That's a problem, eh? Do not have faith in your relationship from your side with God. But your faith must always be in Him. Lord, You said no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Lord, You said I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging for bread. Lord, You said You will never leave me nor forsake me. Though I'm praying and it feels like my prayers are hitting the roof and coming back, doesn't matter. You said You will never leave me nor forsake me. You are with me. That's what that shield of faith is. Lord, You said... And I trust you above my feelings and above the situation and above everything that's happening. And above all, there's the helmet of salvation as well. The helmet of salvation. Why a helmet? Why? Protect your thoughts. Protect your mind. 
You must think as one saved, regenerated. You mustn't think as the person you used to be because I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I'm a brand new man. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. I'm saved. And then you renew your mind. How? By the washing of the word. The more you read the word of God, the more the habits of how you used to think change. And you start to think in line with what? God's word. Get yourself thinking in line with God's word. And then there's the sword of the spirit. I spoke about it. Which is the word of God. When Jesus was tempted, how did he fight? It is written, it is written, it is written. That's the pattern for you in every single battle that you face. You must search the scriptures. If you hit a blank, ask. We don't have because we don't ask. If you hit a blank, ask. Say, Lord, I'm about to go search in the Bible about what's happening in my life right now. Lord, help me to get to the right place. Does it work? It works. If you will ask, it works. It works. Then you'll know where to go and God will tell you what to do. And then you follow the example of Jesus. In that situation you're fighting, you go to God's word and then you start to fight that way. And you fight in prayer. Sometimes you're going to have to say, enemy, it's written. Other times you're going to have to go in prayer. Say, Lord, I'm facing a difficulty. Lord, it's written. When you walk through your day and the situation is not changing... When you go to the bathroom, when you're washing dishes, when you're walking in the garden, get that scripture. It's written. It's written. It's written. Listen, I was addicted to drugs for 13 years. And when God began to speak to my heart and call me back, I began to speak to God in those terms. I said, Lord, if you're not going to save me from this, the devil's going to kill me. I will overdose. I will die. Something's going to happen. If you don't save me, Lord, I'm not going to make it. So I began to speak to God. Then I began to look at the scriptures. When I was young, God said, my name must be called Joshua. So I checked my name. My name means the Lord is my salvation. So I started to pray and I said, Lord, if you called me Joshua, which means the Lord is my salvation, then Lord, you my only way. You must save me. And at that point in time, I did not see a road that I was going to take. I didn't see an open door. There was blackness in front of me. I had no way of getting out of the situation. I did not know how I was going to get out. But I said, Lord, you said. Lord, you called me. Lord, you said if I come to you. Lord, you said if I surrender my life to you, you'll save. You said you will not turn away one that comes to you. You said. And I prayed like that. I said, Lord, you said. You said. You said. And then one night God got hold of me. God changed my whole life. A few, a few things happened over a few weeks. But in one night, in one service, when a pastor prayed for me, I was loosed immediately from... 90% of the stuff. The rest of it I had to struggle through a few months and give it to God and God took it from me. Amen. But I did that. I said, Lord, your word says. Lord, your word says. Lord, your word says. It's good to know what God's word says when your daughter and your wife are both in the emergency room and you're holding your other daughter and she's also sick. Then it's very important for you to say, Lord, you said. At that moment, you can't be looking for God. I'm sorry I haven't prayed, Lord. I'm sorry I haven't read your word, Lord. Lord, please forgive me. I don't want to re be repenting first. I need to be interceding for them. Amen? Which means I need to know what God... Lord, you said you'll never leave them nor forsake them. Lord, I dedicated them to you as young. They're in your hands. If you want to take them, that's your prerogative. But Lord, you said life and life more abundantly. You didn't say short life, Lord. You said a long life. Lord, you said I'm the head and not the tail. You said I'm blessed when I go in and blessed when I go out. You said I'm blessed in the city and blessed in the field. You said blessed shall be my increase and my children, my first fruits. You said I'm blessed, Lord. And you speak to God in those terms. This is how you fight your battles. It is written. It is written. It is written. Amen. It is written. And when the enemy comes to say to you, Oh, but you this, you that, you say to them, you say to him and you answer, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Not my works, not my righteousness, not my goodness, not my prayer time, not my Bible reading, but I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. By the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for me. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Do you stand in him? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. When the Holy Spirit comes, what does Jesus say? He will not speak of himself, but he'll take everything that belongs to me and show it unto you. Amen? The cross is the door. Jesus is the key. The cross is the way to God. There's no other way but coming through the cross. But Jesus Christ is the key. Amen? Jesus, I come to you. Amen? I come to your blood. And I'm, I'm on that solid rock. That's why Jesus says, any man that hears these words of mine and does them is like a man that builds his house 
on a rock. Amen? And when the winds of life and the storms of life hit that rock, hit that house, it'll stand because it's built, built upon a rock. Amen? Are you standing in Jesus? Don't stand in yourself. Don't stand in your education. Don't stand in your learning. Don't stand in preaching. Don't stand in your gifts. Don't stand in anything but Jesus. Lord, I am nothing. I have nothing. I can do nothing except in you, by you, through you, for you. You are the vine. I am the branch. Apart from you, I am nothing. I have nothing. I can do nothing. But if you stay in him and he's in you, there's no devil on earth or in hell that can come against you. Stay in Jesus. And most of all, stay underneath the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We spoke that he gave us victory on the cross, right? That he disarmed the enemy. That he made a public show of the principalities and the powers. But there is something so powerful in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that cannot be underestimated. You need to hear it now. You need to understand it now. The blood of Jesus is a different type of blood because he had no father. He had no father. So he was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And his blood is a different type of blood. And his blood becomes different because of the fact that he lived a perfect, sinless, spotless, holy life. He was pleasing unto God the Father always. What the first Adam couldn't do, the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, did do. Amen? And he lived perfect. That's why when he is sacrificed and his blood is poured out, it is the holy blood of the spotless Lamb of, the Lord Jesus, of, of, Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And there's a song that we sing that says, And it reaches from the highest mountain, and it flows to the lowest valley, and it's the blood of Jesus that's never lost its power. The highest mountain is the mountain of God in heaven in the sides of the north where God is sitting amongst the stones of fire on His throne right now. The blood of Jesus has power with the Father right now because the Father sees that blood. You know how I can say that? You know what God said to Cain? Cain, I hear the blood of your brother Abel call to me from the ground. If the blood, if the blood of Abel could call, how much more do you think the blood of Jesus calls right now? The blood of Cain called out, judgment, judgment, judgment. That's what God heard. You must judge my death. You must judge it in righteousness. You must judge my brother. You know what the blood of Jesus calls out? Mercy, 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 forgiveness, love, peace. And it calls out and it still has power now. So when I come to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you've got to come to that blood, because that blood was shed for me. My sin whipped him. My sin spat upon him. My sin slapped him. My sin pulled out his beard. My sin pierced his hands and his feet. My sin lifted him up between heaven and earth. My sin put him there. But his blood washes me whiter than snow. His blood takes away all my iniquity, all my sin and all my filthiness. His blood, I give him old tattered garments, and he gives me robes of pure white. And that precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ has power. Now listen, if I'm covered by the blood of Jesus, if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, if Jesus has led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men, if I'm in a triumphant procession, if the enemy has no claim to me, why should I be afraid of anything the devil can do? Don't walk with fear of the enemy. I'm in Jesus. That enemy cannot cross the bloodline. And even if he could, which he can't, when he crosses the bloodline, all he's going to get is face to face with the Holy Spirit. He can't cross the bloodline. He can't cross the Holy Spirit. The devil wants the world not to know this, but the blood of Jesus Christ, he doesn't play with the blood of Jesus. He doesn't play with the name of Jesus because the Heavenly Father gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. When I say come out in Jesus' name, it has to go. Not because it's me. But it's because it's the name. Amen? And I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's beautiful, isn't it? Apply the blood of Jesus. I don't like to apply the blood of Jesus to houses and cars. Because I believe God blesses that stuff and protects that stuff anyway. But when I apply the blood of Jesus, I apply it to me. Do you know that I have no avenue? I have no open door. I have no recourse with God. Except by the blood. And through Jesus. So when I say, Lord, into thy presence I come, not by works I've done, but by the blood of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, into thy presence I come, Lord. And then I pray. Lord, I've come by the blood. When I mess up, Lord, I come to the blood. 
That's why I don't like to mess up, because I don't want to treat the blood of Jesus Christ as something cheap. We don't sin and keep sinning because the blood has been poured out, because then you're treating the blood as something cheap. If you make a mistake, you come to the blood, but you, you live holy for God, because you never treat that sacrifice and that blood as something cheap. Amen? We know that, right? But if I mess up, I can't say, Lord, I plead your blood over me. I ask you to forgive me. Please, Lord. And, and then I, I always pray, Lord, and take it out of me so that I don't do this again. So that I don't have to confess again. Lord, set me free from this. Loose me, Lord. Deliver me. Help me, Lord. Amen. That blood washes us whiter than snow. It's beautiful, isn't it? They overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. That's the martyrs in Revelations. They gave up their life for Jesus. There's some, a few months ago, they gave up their lives for Jesus again. Some of the Muslim guys chopped their heads off because they would not deny Jesus. But we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, by the blood of Jesus. Revelations 5, 9. And they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood. By thy, by thy blood, out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, every color, every people, every language, you have purchased us to God as His children by your own blood. I belong to God by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. I can preach a whole nother sermon just on that. We are able to enter into the holiest that's not a temple here but that's the throne room of God in the heavens by the blood of Jesus do you know that before Jesus died and his blood was poured out the closest man could get was in the temple of the Jews behind the veil once a year but not without blood the blood of a lamb and only one man could get that close to where God's presence physically was on earth but after Jesus' blood is poured out, you and I, the Bible says, come boldly into the throne room of God that you might obtain mercy to help in a time of need. That means you need to think of your prayers differently. When you go down on your knees and you close your eyes in your room and you say, Jesus, I want you to from this day realize something. When you've said his name, by his blood, spiritually, you've walked into the throne room of the great king spiritually you might feel like you're sitting in your room but spiritually you've walked into the holy of holies in heaven your prayer is being heard in god's ears in the throne room at that moment i want you to think about that if you will think about that next time you pray your prayer time is going to change the way you pray will change as well because you'll begin to perceive i'm not just sitting here i'm in the throne room of god where he can hear me right now amen it's beautiful isn't it i think it's beautiful we're going to close and I just want to approach the table of the Lord. The Bible says that He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was placed upon Him. And that by His stripes we healed. I love that scripture. I'm going to say it again. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace the price that had to be paid for me to have peace was placed upon him amen and by his stripes we are healed amen i want you to understand as you look at this table i want this table this morning to be a table of victory i'm not a defeated christian always walking around under the whip always struggling to live holy always fighting against sin and temptation i'm not I'm victorious in Christ Jesus. He broke the back of Satan on the cross. He led the captivity kept captive when he ascended into heaven. I have victory in Jesus. Amen. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me before I knew him and all my love is due him. I have victory in Jesus. I'm victorious in Jesus. I'm not, a de I'm not defeated by the enemy. I'm victorious. Amen. I say it, I'm a million times bigger on the inside than I look like on the outside. Because the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of me. There's power on the inside of me you've never seen before. Amen? There's fire on the inside of me by God's Spirit. And it's all given to me by Jesus. Say it with me this morning. I am victorious in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Amen. More than conquerors through Him that loved us.
we more than conquerors i'm not just a, i'm a, over a conqueror amen through christ jesus who loved us amen please stand with me as we approach the table i just want to pray let's bow our heads and close our eyes my heavenly father we approach your table at this moment lord and lord i want to thank you thank you heavenly father for sending jesus thank you jesus that you came thank you holy spirit won't you tell us more about that lovely name of jesus lord we worship you and we praise you as we approach your table now lord we do not do it lightly but we remember that you bled and died for us but lord as we eat and drink now we eat health victory into ourselves because that's what you achieved for us you said do this as often as we will in remembrance of you and we remember the victory that you achieved for us on the cross lord a victory that changed all of eternity and changed all of our lives and we want to thank you for it this morning in jesus name amen and amen we read in the word that on the night that he was betrayed he took the bread and he gave thanks he said this is my body which is broken for you take and eat and do this as often as you will in remembrance of me his body was broken as the penalty of our sin on the same night he took the cup and he gave thanks he said this is the cup of the new covenant take and drink as often as you do this you do it in remembrance of me the cup of the new covenant for the remission of the sins of many the body broken as the punishment the blood poured out as the forgiveness as the redemption as the healing as god had a covenant with abram and isaac and jacob this blood he makes a covenant with you this morning personally you and god cannot break his covenants amen what jesus did was make a covenant between god with all of us amen you are as special by this covenant if not more you're as special to god you individually i'm talking to you you individually i want to get it through you individually are as special to god as abraham was to god as isaac was to god as moses was to god as elisha and elijah were to god you're as special to god this morning if not more because they didn't have a covenant in the blood of his only begotten son we have a covenant in the blood of his only begotten son and when you eat this eat victory eat healing and eat that covenant because that's what it was given for me and god in heaven are in covenant and as he blessed abram isaac and jacob and moses and elijah so will he bless and look after you amen i'm sorry to do this but i just have to lady right there yes don't think of yourself as less in any way don't let people talk you down don't think that god doesn't look at you and doesn't see you don't think that god doesn't love you and care for you because by this covenant you are so precious that if you were the only person that was born he still would have sent jesus to die for you for your healing for your protection for your blessing amen sorry as the holy spirit led me i just had to let's please come forward as a congregation as we sing this song and partake in the holy communion and the covenant that you're in with god